All right, lecture six. We'll talk about unitary transformations and how to find them in the more efficient ways. Now to motivate, I'd like to um, just one more time emphasize that in variational quantum eigensolver, even though the unitary transformation is uh, somewhat optimized by trying to find the unitary transformation that minimizes the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. But the problem is that uh, in order to set up this unitary transformation, you need to use some form. And the most general form consists of exponential number of uh, exponents, uh, these PK operators. And that's the origin of the uh, difficulty because uh, the general unitary transformation for n qubits can uh, be written as an exponential number of these exponents, where at every exponent we have uh, i, because pk's are Hermitian operators, and we need to exponentiate anti-Hermitian operators in order to get the unitary transformations. So tau k's are the amplitudes that are optimized using the VQE cycle. Right? So then optimizing them uh, is not a big problem. But choosing PKs uh, is, is a problem because uh, the number of PKs is 4n minus 1 in total. Why is, for, why is this uh, estimate correct? It's because uh, all these P operators are essentially products of n qubit sigmas, right? And every sigma can be x, y, z or identity. So then there's a f there are four choices for each qubit. That means uh, for n qubits, it's four to the power of n. And minus one, because you don't want to have all identities. So that, that would make uh, exponent just a phase, uh, which is not interesting. Now, for practical calculations, of course, we cannot have m equal to the exponential number of operators. Uh, so we need to somehow select these operators wisely uh, so that uh, with the non-exponential number of uh, these operators we will still have close to the exact estimate for the energy and so essentially the two questions then becomes which pks to select and uh, because they generally don't commute uh, the next aspect is in what order should we put them for the best results now, in this lecture, I mostly address uh, the question which PKs uh, to choose, how to choose them, and the uh, other question is more advanced one, and uh, I'll just refer to the literature for that one. Now, in terms of literature, there are these two papers that address uh, which PKs to choose and how to choose them in two different ways. And in the more advanced reading, you can see our recent papers on the order problem and uh, also on how to reduce the circuits with the uh, choices that you made. Now, returning to the problem of which PKs to choose, there are uh, generally two pathways. Uh, that both can be done on the classical computer because the, the idea here is you want some classical protocol that will allow you to figure out uh, what PKs to try first and uh, then go from there. Uh, that all, uh, the, those protocols need to be efficient on a classical computer, otherwise uh, you won't be able to engage quantum computer uh, without knowing what PKs to try. And uh, the first path is essentially using the fermionic picture, unitary coupled cluster theory. And the second one is energy gradients uh, with respect to the uh, tau amplitudes and uh, has the name uh, qubit coupled cluster theory. So in this lecture, I will not uh, talk about the circuits, uh, how to generate the uh, gates from the PKs. There are compilers for that and it's kind of a relatively technical matter. So I would refer to uh, more uh, specialized literature on that, but that's something that is uh, 
are doable and that's why we are mainly focusing on what PKs should we choose. Uh, once you choose them, then compilers will be able to turn every exponent for every PK into the uh, element of the circuit. All right, so unity coupled cluster theory is a one approach to choose PKs. And uh, it's a unitary version of a classical coupled cluster theory. And the way it's uh, usually presented is that in order to have a unitary operator, you exponentiate anti Hermitian operator that uh, needs to kind of encompass all the excitations and de excitations, uh, starting with, let's say, Hart to Fock uh, configuration where we have occupied orbitals and virtual orbitals A's, right? So all the single excitations would be uh, promoting the electron from the occupied uh, one of those I's to the one of those A's, right? So with some amplitude and the double excitations, uh, similarly we uh, remove two electrons from the I's, uh, I and J say, and promoting them to A and B with some amplitudes and so on up to the n tuples, uh, depending on how many electrons you have, uh, that's how far can you go in these excitations. And those operators are not really uh, Hermitian or anti-Hermitian. So in order to uh, make uh, the exponent of the anti-Hermitian operator, you take the uh, difference between the excitation and the Hermit conjugation of the excitation, which would be the excitation physically. And the idea here is that uh, the importance of contributions uh, decay when you go to the higher and higher uh, excitations, essentially. So the most important ones are deemed to be singles and doubles, and then you go to triples and so on. Uh, the importance of those excitations uh, become smaller and smaller. And so then you can have polynomial number of amplitudes to uh, optimize in order to optimize energy. So that's the basic idea. Now, the problems here is that even though all the uh, all these excitation operators, they actually commute and their components commute with each other. So that's great. But once you add the excitations, uh, then the commutativity is broken. And once the commutativity is broken, you cannot simply write exponent of the sum uh, or exponent of the difference as a, as a product of exponents. So that, that doesn't work anymore because of the non-commutativity. And that's a problem because on a quantum computer, you cannot, uh, again, implement the exponent of the complicated operator. You need to break it down to the exponent of the simple ones. That's why we're talking about exponents of PKs because uh, PKs, uh, those operators, uh, products of qubit ones, uh, they are relatively simple and uh, compilers know how to uh, get them to the gates. Now in this hierarchy, in order to go to the product form of the simpler operators, uh, what is usually done is uh, so-called throttle approximation. The way it works is you can write down this, uh, say for the singles and doubles, where n goes from one to two, uh, you can introduce this uh, kappa operators corresponding to a single excitation, de excitation, and uh, double excitation, de excitation and chop down the, the differences and sums uh, all together into the, uh, essentially into the form where individual excitation, the excitation operators are uh, encompassed in one or incorporated in just one exponent. For that, you have a price to pay, you divide by the uh, large value K, K is a, some kind of constant, and you make K steps. So the larger the K, the more accurate this approximation is. And essentially it's based on the fact that uh, if you want to write exponent of the sum A plus B where A and B, they don't commute, then you can write down the exponent of A times exponent of B, but you, you need to uh, scale down the A and B by some factor K and repeat this uh, K time. And uh, again, the larger the K, the better the results will be. Now, but the problem also with the large K is that it becomes more expensive because you have more products to consider. And uh, usually what uh, is done is uh, in this hierarchy is that uh, in order to uh, 
uh, have uh, relatively small circuits. Uh, K is uh, kept uh, equal to one, uh, which is uh, least expensive among all, but it's more approximate. Now, the good things about this trotterized unitary coupled cluster single double, say with K equals one, uh, the, 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 the most uh, kind of uh, useful properties of this is that, uh, that uh, the excitation and the excitation uh, written in fermionic form, they uh, very frequently, well, they conserve the number of uh, electrons uh, and uh, they also conserve the uh, projection of spin along the z direction. So those are the two quantities that are supposed to be conserved. And uh, symmetry with respect to those quantities are important. Now, if you combine few uh, excitation de excitations, like in the single case where you excite uh, from I, the other electron to the A and D excite. So by combining those uh, two, you can also create the excitation de excitation that uh, uh, conserve the spin as square. So there are ways to uh, create the symmetry adapted uh, configurations uh, in this uh, theory, which uh, will preserve the spin, for example. Now, another good thing about this uh, hierarchy of uh, operators is that uh, fermionic excitations provide Pauli products. Uh, if you do the um, kind of jordan Wigner, for example, mapping or brauer kitaev mapping, doesn't really matter. But uh, the point here is that uh, they will provide some products that are commuting. So essentially the each kappa, in this case, single excitation, the excitation is a linear combination of uh, Pauli products which commute. And that commutativity helps to implement them in circuit in more efficient way. So then there is this uh, work by IBM, a group where uh, they discuss uh, how one can reduce the circuit uh, of the exponent, the sums that are uh, constituting the commuting terms. Okay, but uh, Still, with the unitary coupled cluster theory, the circuits usually are pretty long and uh, hard to implement uh, for large systems. That's why uh, recently it was suggested maybe to uh, start directly in the qubit space instead of going first and formulating the unitary transformation in fermionic uh, space and then transforming it into the qubit space. Why not to work directly in the qubit space? How this can be organized is you again can write down what the expectation value of energy is in terms of some vacuum vector where you act with the unitary and uh, you're trying to estimate the Hamiltonian uh, expectation value. Then again, the same parameterization with PKs. And if you now ask the question, uh, what is the gradient of the energy with respect to tau, uh, particular tau at the zero tau, that will be given by this simple commutator, which you can easily calculate. There are efficient ways to do that. And what this will provide you is a kind of uh, estimate that tells if you have uh, this gradient large, that means this, this, uh, the particular PK actually affects the energy the most, right? And uh, you would like to include that PK into the unitary that you will be using for optimizing the energy. So that's a very simple idea that just look at the gradient and the, the PKs that have a large gradient should be included first. And that's the, essentially the idea of a qubit coupled cluster theory. Now, because we're working in the, in the uh, qubit space uh, and uh, don't spend uh, essentially time in the fermionic space or don't do things uh, unnecessarily, and uh, just go directly to a qubit space, then you can compare the number of two qubit gates, which is the common measure of uh, how uh, long is a circuit. Uh, it's much better in case of uh, qubit couple cluster theory in blue here for these three systems, uh, than the unitary coupled cluster theory, which is trotterized and taken uh, one, uh, one step, k equals one essentially. 
So one caveat though is that uh, because we don't start with the fermionic uh, subspace first in qubit couple cluster, uh, each individual exponent of PKs can easily break symmetries, uh, the ones that are usually conserved with the uh, the uh, unitary coupled cluster theory, like number of particles, for example. But because after all, we are trying to get uh, to the ground state or to the other states of the system, uh, and the Hamiltonian for the system uh, commuting with those symmetries, uh, that means that the variational approach eventually, collectively, should uh, optimize the amplitudes for these PK styles uh, that in, uh, in uh, kind of collective product of uh, all these QCC entanglers uh, would conserve the symmetries essentially. But sometimes that happens, sometimes it, it doesn't. Uh, one needs to be more careful uh, with the couple, uh, qubit couple cluster theory because potentially uh, it can break symmetries and uh, variational approach uh, may not detect that. So one needs to uh, observe that carefully. But uh, the number of uh, gates that uh, qubit couple cluster theory produce is uh, very small compared to UCC. And now this is one example uh, that uh, where this uh, works quite nicely. It's a water, key, uh, water molecule. If you break uh, two bonds at the same time, uh, oxygen, hydrogen bonds, you stretch symmetrically. Then uh, this is essentially electronic energy, atomic units uh, with respect to this uh, symmetric bond stretch for different methods. And this system considered to be hard because classical uh, methods like coupled cost a single double. Uh, if you look at the uh, kind of error that uh, this uh, good uh, classical approach uh, has for this molecule uh, compared to the exact method, in blue here, uh, it goes below and kind of uh, keeps deviating and uh, the, the error kind of keeps growing, uh, which is uh, not good. And then the mean field theories, uh, they are too far also from above, uh, from the, the exact answer. Now the qubit coupled cluster theory with just uh, eight entanglers can uh, get the chemical accuracy and be on top of the uh, exact curve for this system, which is very challenging for the classical methods. Now with that, I would like to summarize that uh, finding efficient unitary ansatz for variational quantum eigensolver is one of the most uh, pressing issues, especially for strong, strongly correlated systems. And uh, strongly correlated systems are the ones like a water molecule, symmetric stretch, where classical methods break down. And uh, the problem with this uh, search for the unitaries is that uh, the, the unitary, uh, general unitary transformation lives in exponentially large space. We saw that uh, in order to parameterize, you need to have exponential uh, number of operators. And for, of course, you cannot afford parameterizations like that. And one needs to carefully choose uh, which uh, entanglers to put in the, in the parameterization in order to construct efficient circuits. Two approaches uh, we discussed uh, based on fermionic and qubit representations uh, to find the right PKs and uh, unitary coupled cluster theory has this advantage of uh, conserving symmetries or yeah, have some somewhat easier time conserving symmetries. But because of that, uh, it uh, is more expensive in terms of gates in the sense that it worries about symmetry even think of it as like worries about symmetry at every step, at every entangler or combination of entanglers. And uh, that's why it's kind of, uh, there's a well, pain the price uh, because of that. It's kind of having a large overhead because of this uh, symmetry conservation. Uh, but the, in the qubit couple cluster theory, we ignore symmetries uh, at the individual level. And that's why the circuit becomes very uh, efficient. Uh, but uh, at the end of the calculation, one needs to really uh, be careful and uh, check that the symmetries are conserved uh, in that theory. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, here are some questions for further discussion.